everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast and today I'm joined by mountaineer, storyteller and writer John D. Burns. Hello John. Hello Alistair, how are you doing? I'm well, I'm good, well. Good, good, nice to see you. And um, we're here mainly to talk about your latest novel which is called Sky Dance. And now I'm really fascinated by you as a writer and in that introduction itself, mountaineer and storyteller. But let's start by talking a little bit about Sky Dance. Right, okay, okay. Well, Skydance is a, 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 my first novel, my first real trip into, into a, a long piece of fiction. Um, but it's based very much in the same world as my other two novels, the world of bothies and mountains and remote places. And Skydance really came about because uh, I've been walking and climbing for years, um, and over the, over the last four or five years I've been coming increasingly concerned with what happens to the environment mm-hmm. what happens to the wildlife in the wild places I go uh, and I think my relationship with wild places has kind of deepened and over the years I, 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 when I was younger and, and, and fitter and a lot slimmer than I am now <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> well yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I've just had a big fry up I probably wasn't <laughs> a good idea um, I used to run about in the hills and do climbs and I, to be quite honest with you I didn't really bother too much about the mountain environment right it was, it was just a backdrop and it was just somewhere that we, we took on various challenges but over the recent years I've kind of slowed down a bit and I go to Bothy's a lot I'm probably in the outdoors now Perhaps even more than I ever was, but I've become interested in, 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 in the wildlife, the the, the plants, the, the the forestry, and what's happened yeah. to our hills. And I wanted to, to to find a way, really, to to talk to the average hill walker, the average mountain climber that I knew, and to introduce them to some of the concerns that I had. I talk a lot about about the well the the, 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 the title Sky Dance yeah. comes really from the um, the mating display that the male hen harrier puts on right which is called a sky dance he, he performs this yeah, a great aerial display really showing off how agile and how fit he is and this is how, this the idea of that is to attract the ladies you know and um, but but hen harriers are. Uh, birds of prey, if you don't know, they're birds of prey that, 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 that inhabit the whole of Britain. Um, there are only about half a dozen pairs left in England. But in Scotland, there's, hopefully, there's about 40 odd breeding pairs because we're a bit more remote. But um, they're iconic because they kind of symbolise wildness and they're also threatened by uh, sporting pursuits and yeah. uh, illegally killed and shot. So um, Skydance was, was, was um, the iconic name that I gave the novel. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really, the story is pretty simple, really. It's two hill walkers yeah. who, who uh, spend their time climbing and walking, much as I did. An older guy called Angus and a younger guy called Rory, who's much more switched on. And, 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 and Angus is kind of based on me and a lot of other folk like me, um, who didn't didn't don't really have much awareness of, of, of the environment. And really, it's 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 about I suppose Angus's road to Damascus, where he he learns what's happening to our environment, and the, and the pair of them begin to protest and begin to take an active role in the environment, which is which is really what I'm hoping that will come out of Sky Dance. It's interesting because you're based in Inverness, isn't yes, it? Yes, right? that's right. That's where I'm. And, yeah. and I, uh, every year, I think I at least visit it once, and it always strikes me that there's a place which probably folk from the central belt still think as being a village in the Highlands or a town in the Highlands, but it's Aye. sprawling. So it seems to be bigger every time. <laughs> that's yes, my impression does. of it. You know, as you, the, the, it, the oh, boundaries no, you, are getting it. You're right. It is. It's gro- uh, Inverness is growing exponentially. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 we, everybody in Inverness wonders where everybody else is coming from. You know. <laughs> um, part, part of the truth, to be honest, though, actually, is it, it is that um, I think Inverness, as the capital of the Highlands, it's a big town. It's not really a city. Yeah. Inverness. You know, you can, the definition of a city is you can get lost in it. You can't really get lost in Inverness. But it's it's. Um, it's drawing in folk from all across the Highlands. Yeah. So one of the one of the downsides for that is that the the smaller villages on the west coast, places like that, are struggling to survive as 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 they lose population and as they're increasingly given over to kind of holiday cottages and that sort of stuff, which isn't can't really sustain the community in the way in the way it did, you know. Because it's 
as you say, then it's it's expanding. But then you've got perhaps the most iconic scenery in yes. Scotland with the Loch Ness and then, you know, yes, the, the, yes, the whole yes. canal. Um, the and Canal. Yeah, the last yeah. time I was there, there's a lot of building, modernising of the That's canal, right. certainly coming yeah. into Inverness. And so is that something that you're very aware of? I mean, you talk about, it, it's in the book, where um, part of the concerns is how our country and our wildlife and our, uh, are being treated. Is that something that kind of sparked that or has it been something that's been with you for a while? It's, I've had an awareness of that for a while, I would say, but it's over the last few years that my concerns have kind of grown. M- my view really of, of, of the Highlands, when I, when, I, when, I was, uh, when I was a boy almost, said, not that long ago, I've got the, the memory isn't quite that good really, but um, you know, years and years ago, when I got into hill walking, I was down in England uh, and I went to the Lake District. Yeah. And, I, and I grew up in Merseyside. Merseyside. My dad worked in the Camelard shipyard, and it was like a a very industrialised area. Uh, and if you went to the countryside or what what passed for the countryside yeah. in Merseyside, it was really fairly intensively farmed, and it was it was owned by um, lords, and, and it was owned by by, by by various interests. And if you strayed from the path, there'd always be a sign saying "No trespassing." You can walk this yeah. way. And when I went to the Lake District, I, I, I saw what at that time I the eyes that I had. You, you always see through things through the eyes that you have at that time. And and and, and through my eyes as a young man. I, I saw an amazing wild wilderness, yeah. um, a, a place where I could wander and where no one would sort of tell me, I can't go there, you can't go up there, you've, you've got to go down here. And then uh, subsequently, we, we, me and my mates you know, began to get interested in, 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 in the outdoors and we walked the Pennine Way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that felt like, a, again, a, a, a big wild adventure moving further and further north. And the Pennine Way sort of... Then just just about crosses the Scottish border. Yeah, and I can remember um, we, we we finished the Pennine Way, and, and as you can imagine, we were pretty knackered after walking all that way. And we couldn't think, but, but the, we had a day off the following day, and we couldn't think of anything else to do, so we went for a walk. And I remember uh, we, we we stopped on a bridge, and um, I, I, the, the, I saw my first otter swimming underneath that bridge. And you know, I came from Merseyside, where um, the Mersey was so polluted that it was a fire risk. The River yeah. Mersey, if you, if you threw a fag end in the, in, in, into, the, into the Mersey, there was a bloody good chance the whole thing had, <laughs> had lighted up. I think you know? the Clyde was very similar. I think the Clyde was very similar, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's changed now, I'm glad to yeah. say. Um, but, and, my, and, and then I obviously came to Scotland and, and, and began climbing and walking in Scotland. And again, it seemed a wild and, 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 and remote place, untouched really by, by human hand. But since... My understanding of what's going on in the Highlands, what's happening to, to, to the wildlands that we've got, is I realise that actually I see through different eyes now. Yeah. And these eyes, I, I, I see a, a scarred landscape, actually. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the one that's been stripped of its forestry, of its wild yeah, yeah, creatures. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are, there are practices like driven grouse shooting, where... Um, but if people who don't know, you're basically driven grouse shooting is a, a practice of rich men, basically. It's almost entirely rich men who own large tracts of land, maybe 16 to 20% of Scotland. That's a hell of a lot of land. Yes. And these areas are managed as grouse moors. And if you're going to manage a grouse moor, basically what you have to do is you have to ensure there's lots and lots of grouse for grouse, which are little birds, if you don't know, <laughs> for, for, for guys to shoot. And the only way to do that is to keep the, the predators, the raptors down and that that means that um, the, these moorlands are, 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 are managed in a very artificial way and a lot of the wildlife that should be there is actually destroyed. Um, and the other side of that, of the coin, is really a, a, an awful lot of the highlands that I've been wandering for years are again deforestated because of uh, sheep farming but also the need to keep a, a lot of deer on the land mm-hmm. and, and deer, deer will graze the place to death they'll stop any new trees sprouting up and so we end up with what is in fact a sort of green desert yeah uh, and, it, and that that that's really a part a part of that to be honest what i'm trying to do in skydance is say well that's what we've got now that's the that, that, that's the landscape that we have what 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 kind of landscape could we have yeah because i think i think if you if you envisage it it, you know, it could be a very different place. It could be a for it could be forested, which would be good for the environment, and it could be teeming with wild animals, lynx, hopefully even wolves. 
all sorts of creatures. I, I'm not pretending that will be a simple process. It yeah. wouldn't. It would be difficult. Of course it would. Um, but I think we don't have a vision of where we're going. Yeah. And there are quite a, a lot of very good books, uh, you know, written by people. Um, David Hetherington's book, uh, The Links and Us, is great about the links. Talks about that. Um, there's uh, other books. Uh, Andy Whiteman's book on. Uh, about land ownership yes, in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, great books, really good books. But um, from my point of view, as a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a yobbo climber, really, um, they tend to be very academic. Mm -hmm. And so, Skydance is a bit different because Skydance is, by and large, it's a yarn, it's a tale, yeah. you know, and it's it's a comic tale. There's humour in it, and underneath it all, I wanted to get across the message about well, what are we actually doing with our wild lands? Uh, and so that's that, that's where I came. I think you asked me originally where I came from, and it, uh, in, in writing Skydance, and that's really my my journey in my awareness of what's happened to our wild land. But do you think that's important? Because um, as you say, there's been a lot of um, focus in Scotland recently on land ownership, and, and yes. that debate, thankfully, is coming to the fore. Yes, I to discussing it. But I think um, if you can imagine something or a place or uh, um, imaginatively, um, fictionally, for want of a yeah, better term, yeah, yeah. then that does something else, because then people start to think about it differently. This was something that um, Alistair Gray once wrote about in uh, Glasgow in his book Lanark, was that you know, if, right. a, if a city doesn't imagine itself artistically, then it doesn't really have a sense of itself. And I wonder if you think that's something that's important to do in the countryside. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you see, I think we, we, we... You can get so far... Um, in discussing things in intellectually and cerebrally, if you like. Um, I, but I think if you're trying to change someone's mind, trying to in influence them differently, um, confronting them with arguments doesn't normally help. Because if you, if you confront someone with a discussion or an argument, what happens 99% of the time is people become more, more entrenched in the views that they already have. But what I've tried to do with Skydance, I don't know whether I've succeeded, but that's what I've tried to do, is to get people to look through someone else's eyes yeah. to to engage their imagination and I think if you can get people to imagine something which is a different vision a different place then actually you can move it's kind of like a change of heart really um, we, we uh, well I, I suppose if you if you look at the kind of we have, we have more discussion these days than we ever did yes. things like uh, internet discussion rooms all those sort of things uh, Twitter Facebook all that sort of stuff but they don't tend to be discussions, they tend to be arguments. Yeah. They tend to be people shouting at each other. And often it's the people, one group of people are, are, are talking to the people that they all agree with, shouting about one thing, and then there's people who disagree with something else. And views actually, in my opinion, through the internet become more entrenched. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you've got to kind of move beyond that and say, okay, well, what, 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 what can you see? What, what does this person see when they walk out in the hills? Could this be different? Could, what could we see? Because we have a great chance with Scotland. Scotland is, is an incredible environment. And, and we could move on from the, the very damaged landscapes that we've got now. It would take up to 20, 30, 40 years' time to a, to a different world, a different place. Uh, Scotland could be uh, you know, an incredible example of yeah. what, how you can preserve wild landscapes and make them work with the people who live there and make you know, thriving communities exist in these remote places. It's interesting. I think a lot of people who spend most of their time in a yeah. urban centres, for want of a better word, they maybe they might be slightly aware of what you're talking about. I don't think they're aware of the details. Mm -hmm. I'm only more aware than I would have been because my brother lives in Braemar. He's been there for 20 years now. Okay. So there's a place where yeah, yeah. I've got everything that you've said. You know, Absolutely. you go up there, yeah, yeah. you can see areas that were mm -hmm. forested mm -hmm. absolutely flattened. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. sometimes you see the most surreal of things. I remember once there was a big cull on All right. um, deer and they were having helicopters flying them, yeah, you yeah. know, the bodies out. You think this is like some weird <laughs> kind of cross between what a ship down in Vietnam or something like that? Well, it is, it is, it is. Well, we, you know, you, you, we, we've all watched these dystopian movies where um, aliens have landed on Earth and they've, destroyed, they've ravaged the earth, they've destroyed everything, they've killed most of the population, and the pop people like us, the human population, are living at the edges, the margins. Yeah. Well, actually, that's what's happened to our land. You know, the only difference is that we, we are the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we've destroyed the landscape. 
and, and our wildlife, the indigenous wildlife, is living in the little crevices that we left be- behind. Yeah. It's interesting, I was thinking as I was coming through about um, recent fiction that has been set in Highlands and Islands of Scotland, and quite a lot of it is either science fiction or fantasy. You know, it's where people have... There's been a problem in the cities. The cities have either oh, right, submerged yeah, 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 yeah. or whatever, so they've gone to settle in the kind of last yes. places that yeah. they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I was also thinking about the writers who have, like you, have kind of celebrated and tried to get people to think differently about wildlife. Um, and the resurrection of Nan Shepherd, for instance, as a, as yes, a writer, yes. has been huge, I think, in the Grampian Absolute, area. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, do you have favourite writers that you, you kind of inspired you? Yeah, I've, I've got a variety of folk, really. I, I read quite wildly. Uh, wildly? Wi- mm. Widely is what I meant to say. <laughs> oh, probably wildly as well. Um, I, I, yeah, I like people like Robert McFarlane. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's got a, a, a fantastic way of describing places. But I also like, I, like, I also like the way Bill Bryson writes about stuff. Yes. Because at the end of the day, um, Skydance less so, but my previous books were mm-hmm. actually travel writing. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm writing about. Um, but I think I, I like anything that re engages uh, people with the landscape that, that, that they move through, you know? Um, well, let's talk a little bit about your previous ones. Um, you had the the last Hillwalker, yes, which is a great um, section in the back, which says it's about you falling in and out of love with the hills. That's right. So, what? Tell us about falling in and out of love with the hills. I'm fascinated <laughs> by that. Oh, okay. Well, I think I have a relationship with the hills. It's lasted well over forty years, you know. And like all relationships, they change. Some end, some grow, some 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 move in different directions that you wouldn't expect. Um, I think my, my, my relationship with the hills, um, I came to Scotland we over 30 years ago now, moved to, to live in Inverness, mainly so that I could, uh, I could indulge my hobby of hill walking and climbing, yeah. and I was, I was a, a big ice climber, I, winter climbing was my, was my great passion in life, uh, and mountaineering was, was what I did, it was, it, was, it was in my veins really. And I went on like that way for quite a long time, uh, and then uh, I said, I guess, in about fairly late in a way, I was still climbing uh, into my into my fifties, but um, I began to develop this urge to write, to create things. Yeah. And it seemed initially to me that the the the, the, the running about on the hills and climbing stuff, and uh, writing and creating things were two entirely different things. I think that's very interesting. That were things that could not, I couldn't marry both together. And I, I thought, well, I, 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 I don't want to. Do, I've done climbing. Yes. Uh, what am I going to do? You know, I've not been. I've, I've had experiences about everything there is to experience in climbing. Now, apart from getting killed, and that's, I've done. I need done that a few times. So I thought, well, you know, uh, I'll move on. I'll, 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 I still needed some sort of an adrenaline buzz, so uh, I did. I, I took up stand-up comedy, things mm. like that, you know. And I thought, well, well, I initially thought, right, right. For a couple of years, I stopped going to the hills completely, and I thought, that's it. That that chapter of my life is finished. It's over. But um, something was kind of gnawing away at me, and I thought, well, okay, I've done this uh, for forty years. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll write a memoir and. The Last Hill Walker was essentially my farewell to the hills. Right. I was going to write that, put it in a box, sell it, or whatever people wanted, wanted to do with it, and say, okay, I did that, I finished with that. But uh, <laughs> a couple of strange processes that you didn't really anticipate actually took, took place. Um, and as I was writing The Last Hill Walker, I kind of had to relive, obviously, the experiences that I had when I was a teenager finding the Lake District, the experiences I had when I was a little bit older in mountain rescue and in, in, the, in, the, in the winter hills. And, and, and part of that actually, re- strangely enough, reawakened in me. I suddenly began to remember, actually, I did get something out of that. But it was also a, a more, a more um, practical thing in a way, in that, in that I was still walking. I had a job that took me out walking and assessing. Uh, I, I used to risk assess walks to make sure that we're okay for people to do and um, 
I can remember one particular occasion I was out on Darva Moor, which is a quite a high moor not far from Grant, between Grant and Spey and, and, and Forest and Elgin that way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, it, I was walking the old railway line that used to walk over there, and this was in May. And it had been a, a late May, and as you know, in the Highlands, you know, May can be winter, it can be yeah, summer. Yeah, very much so. It, it can do whatever it wants. That, win, that, that May was winter. And uh, I have a very vivid memory of, of walking along and uh, a little, uh, 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 what you call it? <laughs> a stoat, a stoat mm-hmm. stepped out in front of me. Now, because it was, because it was th- deep snow and it was very soft, the stoat couldn't hear me. Uh, and he danced about, he was dressed, he was in his little <laughs> ermine coat, you know, yeah. with a wee black tail, and he was dancing, jumping about in front of me. And I was fascinated watching this little creature. And after about a couple of minutes, he, he sort of did a wee double take, looked round and saw me behind him, and then just vanished in a, like a puff of, I would say smoke, but it was really ice crystals, I suppose. And that image stayed with me. Yeah. And, and I, I tried to sort of rationalise it, almost tried to forget about it. But actually, that, 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 that image of that wild creature, that little glimpse of wildness kind of stayed in my mind. And, it, and, and I don't know, I, I kind of felt I wanted to see that again. Yes. And it drew me back. And so uh, I, my, I, it kind of reawakened my desire to go into the hills again. Mm-hmm. But, the, but, but the, by the time I went back into the, into the hills, my relationship had changed. Yeah. I wanted to, to, rather than running about and, and, and ticking off hills or climbs, I wanted to go places and I wanted to see wildlife. And yeah. I wanted to know more intimately these places. So I was more interested when I came back to hill walking in the environment rather than just going up pointy things. So do you think this was, a, this was a result of artistically dealing with it? Because it seems, as you said earlier, you were climbing mountains because they're there and you mm. were like mm. ticking mm. off, mm. you know, uh, Monroe's or whatever that was. And then you went, I'm, not that I'll take my time, but I'll maybe start to look around instead of being the, the top being the be all and end all. Yes, that's right. It's the journey rather than getting there. That's yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, I think that the you know if if, you, if you're going to write something about your experiences, then you you, you kind of have to not only relive them but kind of break them down a bit and think well. What did I get out of that? And what, what did that... Because your experiences aren't just things that happen around you. They're things that happen to you. Yes. And you, you, they change you as well. And I probably didn't realise that. I think that the, the writing um, The Last Hill Walker, by the end of it, made me realise that probably the, the, the reason that I'd gone to the hills in the first place actually wasn't about um, the challenge it gave it wasn't really about how many Monroe's I could get up it wasn't really about what climbs I could climb what I actually needed and got from that experience was a contact with nature yes that I hadn't really appreciated that so I can now quite happily take out take away I was up a hill three or days ago but I can I, I can do without that side of it yeah but what I realised what I can't do without it is, is the contract with the natural world yeah. and, and it, it means much more to me now to get a, a, a glimpse of a seagull mm. or a hen harrier or, or a wild cat than it means to me to climb Ben Nevis if that yes. any yeah, I, 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 absolutely I think that's right um, apart from anything else it gets more difficult to climb it Nevis. gets more difficult <laughs> yeah 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 so let's talk a little bit about the Bothy tales now I presume most people will know what Bothies are but you said earlier on you become increasingly uh, interested in them and visiting them so could you tell us a little well, bit about yeah, your yeah, yeah. well just for those who don't know maybe um, yeah. I, 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 but certainly in Scotland uh, people are more familiar with Bothies but I think in England they're not as widely known and, and obviously you know people may be listening from all over the yeah, of course. world um, a Bothy is, a, is a, a, a rudimentary shelter normally something like an old shepherd's cottage and they're places that um, they're, they're abandoned and a bit rough and they've got like well, it's easy to tell you what they haven't got they're, they're usually wind and water tight but they've no running water they've no electricity there's no broadband yeah. and if you want to keep warm you've got to carry your fuel in with you and it's normally lit by candles it's a bit like going on holiday in the 15th century <laughs> that's, that's probably the best way of describing it uh, but it's it, but to me they're magical places they're uh, you know, you, you meet other people and you, you sit around a fire and 
one of the few places I think where stories are still told. Yeah, we've kind of lost that storytelling tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and yarns and tales, and bothy tales because I because I've. I, 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 I spend a lot of time in Bothies. Yeah. Um, the great thing about going to Bothies is if you if you walk walk through the mountains for a day walk, you tend to have an aim and objective. You get your objective or objectives, and you you go back and you climb up your car and you go away again. Yeah. But uh, I think if you're if you stay in a Bothy, it's actually a, a, a closer relationship because you get to see the mountain as and the hills as the, as as dusk falls and uh, there's a different character to the noises wild change and uh, noises change exactly yeah. you know you'll probably sit there and a little bothy mouse will pop out or whatever and you if you you're taking more time there you're not in such a hurry and, and if you're not in such a hurry uh, you know the, the hurrying man doesn't not see as much as the as the one who takes his time and and you'll catch glimpses of things that you didn't so um, yeah I, start, I started writing these are it's a blend really of 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 stories of yarns that I've experienced and and also of um, some fiction as well it began yeah. to get band, began to get me into fiction and, and what surprised me really was that, um, that, that in terms of how people responded to it um, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by how um, the last hillwalker has been so popular it's been um, bestseller on Kindle mountain list for over a year now yeah um, and I think, uh, t- to be honest, I think that's because I'm I'm telling the story of a whole generation of hill walkers. Yeah. There's lots of people like me, maybe a bit older, maybe a bit younger, who went through all the things that I went through. They went through the the, the, the crappy equipment. They went through the, the bad gear. They got soaked. They had no money. They and they and they grew they grew older. They moved along, did different things, and have been on that same journey with me. And so I think it's relatable to them. Yeah. And I, and I think I think we, we you know we I'm, I'm I'm a sort of baby boomer, you know, and we we, we had it easy, you know. We we, you know, we 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 we've spent all the pension money. Uh, we've got all that. Um, the environment's buggered. That was us too. You know, we, we we're pretty well, uh, and, and we we we've got all these good decent pensions, and and we retired. And when I when, well when I was a student, the government gave me money. Mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. You know, <laughs> it was great. Um, but but I think I think we're that generation, and for we sort of kind of queered the pitch for uh, successive generations. For them, it's a lot harder. Yeah. Um, so I've written the, the tale of that generation, and I'm guessing. Well, I suppose things have changed a bit, really, in that I think when I was a climber, when I got into climbing, it was before the internet. It was before you could go on courses. So if you wanted to know how to climb, you, you had to meet a group of blokes with beards in a pub, uh, and this was supposed to be some sort of climbing club, and they'd take you out and show, literally show you the ropes. Whereas now it's very different from that. Now you probably wouldn't get people meeting strangers in pubs and saying, "We're you taking you out into the wilderness." I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> you, you probably no. Well, no, you don't. Uh, and so it, that, that we we've both gained and lost the yeah. the internet's a, a fantastic thing. I, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for the internet, and we wouldn't be talking to. Yeah, I wouldn't be talking to you, and we wouldn't be uh, uh, listeners wouldn't be, wouldn't be listening to us. But um, you know, I think we've also lost that that community there was a community of climbers and you could walk into a bar and you'd know who the climbers yeah. were yeah, yeah. and they'd have something in common with you and also the great thing about the, the, about, about the, 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 the sport of climbing and hill walking was I think it was a sport but it was also more of a way of life I think and also in climbing clubs and, 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 and that community there was a place for people who perhaps wouldn't fit in anywhere else. Right. Um, people, let's be honest, people with borderline and perhaps sometimes more than borderline mental health problems, mm-hmm. and they would be accepted into a mountaineering club. Um, I wouldn't say that was always easy, but it was, it was, it was, it was, it was these were guys who were characters and they might have their own problems, but there was a place for them. And I think that's much more difficult now that we have a, in some ways a sanitised society you know so uh, that's uh, I forgot what the question was <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's very interesting because now we're increasingly told I think it's right it's one of the reasons that I like to go walking um, is this idea that it can clear your head it can 
um, if you have uh, anxieties and, and, and problems, then often a good constitutional, as we'll call it, a good walk, yeah, 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 yeah. a really helpful thing. In fact, in, I know now that uh, even in, in, in Glasgow there are walking clubs absolutely, started, absolutely, which are absolutely, absolutely with that aim, with people absolutely. to get together and yes. be able to yes. share the experience in a yes. positive sense, right. in a safe way as well. Um, I'm interested in uh, this idea of telling tales and storytelling in particular, because you know you say mountaineer, storyteller, and writer, and it seems to me that the stories, certainly historically, that used to surround the um, Scottish uh, Highlands and Islands were often supernatural. They were often yes. um, ghost stories. We certainly writers like Hogg and Stevenson and, and Walter Scott adapted them and, and published them and you know yes, did well out right. of them but these were based in the telling of stories by the very people yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. is that the kind of thing that you were thinking of when you had Bothy Tales was there those kind of well yes in fact uh, somebody contacted me yesterday and told me that they were, they, 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 they were sitting in a high on Bothy with a, a few friends and they were one of them was reading Bothy Tales to them so that's that. If it's done that, if it's achieved oh, that, it's fantastic, you know. But I can just I can, uh, that's going back to the, the, the tradition, really, um, uh, of people getting together and maybe playing a guitar, maybe a few, singing a few songs, and telling a few stories. The tradition is not so much in the stories themselves; it's in the actual act of storytelling. Um, I know a, a great Highland storyteller, uh, Bob Pegg, who lives in Strathpeffer. And he, he, he's got some fantastic stories, he tells stories about the last wolf and, and, and these things that are passed into legend. But I think, I think one of the things that, that, that certainly <laughs> what you, you can do, and Bothy Tales does, and in a sense, in a sense, um, The Last Hill Walker is, is kind of like me sitting around a Bothy fire yeah. telling yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the yarns Absolutely. and the stories that I would have told. Uh, and one of the great things about 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 mountaineering, particularly, mountaineering actually lends itself to storytelling very well, because you start out on this endeavour, and you're probably apprehensive about what you're going to face, and you may not be that sure that you're going to succeed in yeah. what you do, and 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 what you do is dangerous. Um, there are demons, there are monsters out there, and you face these things, and you either succeed or you don't, and you maybe discover something about the landscape or even about yourself that you didn't know. Yeah, and that's a great thing. That's a story. That's that. That in itself is a story. And so I, I, I've I've sat in bothies and places like that and listened to guys talking about their experiences, what's happened to them, and those things are unique. You can't. One of the things you can't do. Um, and in life in general, but certainly in mountaineering, you can't go out and buy experience. No, you can't. You can't. You know, if you go to climbing shops and you get a great pair of boots, you get fantastic outdoor gear, you can get uh, really good equipment. But you don't get. Uh, but but a, a night out in a wild storm on a Highland hill does not come wrapped in cellophane that you can open it. The only way you can do that is by going through it. It's interesting you should say that because what struck me about reading Skydance is the language, isn't it? Is clearly written by someone who has experienced the wild, the, you know, nature red and tooth and claw, for one uh-huh. of yeah, you yeah, know, the, have, the, yeah. the, the descriptions of the wind coming in from the coast, or, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the, 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 the way you describe the relationship with animals and, you know, love them but respect them, and, you know, particularly thinking of the wolves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of the wolves. Um, so, did that, did writing come naturally to you? Did you have, through your experiences, this vocabulary, if you like, about how to describe what had happened to you or what you'd experienced over the 30 years or more? Well, that's a, really, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm still trying to find the words to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does think, read like that. I me? think I always will, you know. I'm not, I'm not there yet. Um, well, I, to be honest with you, um, my, 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 I started writing more out of necessity than desire, in a way. Um, I began uh, writing... Uh, when I, I have an autistic daughter mm-hmm. and I, I lived with her I looked after her for, on, on my own for about three or four years and um, it, again it was the internet that got me into it I, I, was, I was struggling really to cope with, with my feelings and about with the experiences of, of, of isolation I guess of the challenges that I, I, I lived with her and uh, I came across through the internet a discussion board uh, of people who lived with autism 
And there were lots of discussions on diet, on medication, on, on, on ways of coping with autism. But it seemed to me very dry. It didn't seem to me to be touching on the experiences that I had. And I had to have some way of expressing those feelings. Yeah. And I, I wrote a, a book of poetry uh, called Wind Dancer. Um, and that, that, that was... I, I couldn't have told you at the time, mm-hmm. but I would not have been able to see this, but that was my way of coping with that situation was to write it down. Yeah. And that kind of triggered something in me. Uh, I'd always kind of had some kind of a vague idea that I could write, but you know, life gets in the way. Yeah. You, you've got jobs, you've got work, you've got things to do, and you you, know, you put writing to the bottom of the pile, so it never gets to the top. And um, through this, I started by writing Wind Dancer, and it wasn't even going to be a book, but there was, I didn't know it, but there was a publisher on this discussion board, Wendy Webb, and she got in touch and said, look, if you've got enough of these poems, we'll make a book. And, and suddenly I produced a book. And I thought, well, if I can do that, then we can do something else. And I got into a variety. Because it was in the Highlands, uh, again, it can be fairly isolating. It's not, you know, you, 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 there's not a, a massive population that you can make, mingle with of writers. And there are some, but not yeah. that many. And they tend to be maybe some distance away or whatever. And I tried various different pursuits. I, I wrote some drama and I started to go and did a bit of acting and performing. And through that, we talked about the vocabulary, I think through that I began to learn how to express myself. And I've got a long way to go. I think I'm only about halfway through this journey. Maybe I'll, which I'll probably never finish, but, but, but um, I'm, that, it was a combination. What, what came together with Skydance uh, I think it's funny in places. Yeah. I hope it is anyway. <laughs> and and certainly his last Hill Walker and, and Bobby Tales are. Um, and I think that, that you know my, my experience is doing a, a stand up, uh tone my comedy writing skills and enable me to learn how to do different things. And the great thing the great thing that, that I've, I've performed a couple of one man plays, two one plays, what one man man one one man play about the occultist Alistair Crowley which I'm very interested in maybe that's a conversation uh, so maybe a different conversation <laughs> yeah. and also um, the um, the mountaineer George Mallory yeah um, but the great thing about that I performed both of those at the Edinburgh Fringe um, and the great thing about that was that, that, that well, which is different from writing is that I was able to actually meet my audience yes and and, ah, and you yes. get you can stand up in drama. You get instant feedback yeah. straight away. If you tell a joke, it ain't funny. They don't laugh. You know about you it. You know it, but yeah. Um, and, and the same with acting. You can kind of get that energy back. And if you don't get the energy back, you know it's not working or whatever. And this is working. And um, but I get, I got to know who I was talking to. Mm-hmm. And I think the same kind of people who came and saw me as Mallory certainly are the same kind of people that read my books. Yeah. Uh, I know I can walk. I can walk down Princess Street in, in the Fringe and say that person might come to my play. Those people won't. I knew exactly who they were. Um, so it, 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 it's developed me in that way. Well, I think what's interesting is that I didn't know what to expect with Skydance. Um, I, what I didn't expect was this, as you say, funny, um, thrilling. Um, but with with that. Um, ability to make you think just about you know how we not only treat the wild at the moment but mm-hmm. how possibly things could change going forward yeah um so if, if that's what you wanted to achieve you certainly if, if that's what that. i wanted to achieve I, it, it, it's tricky writing something like sky dance in in the, um i think if, if 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 you are immersed in those uh, ideas already you might find the book, well, I, I, I kind of know this, that's a bit tricky. Mm. But, so I'm trying to write it. It was interesting that you talked about the Lake District. Um, because the Lake District is, is held up as, a, as a, 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 a sort of perfect idea of the way it should be. Yet, yet the Lake District is heavily overgrazed. Yeah. Um, and I think that I was down talking in England recently and I started talking about driven grouse shooting. And somebody said to me, what a grouse. Mm-hmm. So, so there, there, there is a big difference between yeah, the culture yeah. in England and the culture in Scotland. Um, and, 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 and so writing something that was... that made some sense to people from different cultures, from different areas of Britain, and with different backgrounds, was actually pretty tricky. Um, and whether I achieved that, I don't know. 
Um, so it was really the sort of people who, well, it, it's it's targeted mainly. What I'd like South Skydance to be able to do is to talk to the people who, who walk the Pennine Way, who walk in in, 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 in Cumbria, who, who walk those areas, and are not aware that actually what they're walking in is a very artificial environment. <laughs> That message. If I get that, because those are the majority. Yeah. That that, and I, I, it's really important. I think in that in that, if we want land reform, if we want reform of what happens in our wild places, then people have to care about it. And you can't get people to care without giving them some sort of understanding. Yes. Uh, and I also think that one of the things that's happening at the moment is uh, bothies have become quite popular, and. Um, in some instances, there's a bothy culture, a group of, you yes. know, a sort of small community go to bothy through. And I think perhaps sometimes they're concerned that people are coming out into bothies who don't know how to behave, who perhaps cut down live wood, who do things that you shouldn't really do in a while. But my feeling is actually, it's these people who are quite important to us. Yeah. Because it, 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 people will not value something. They will not talk to their politicians about it. They will not campaign for it unless they actually have experienced it and valued it. And part of that is growing the community that we have. Because actually, a huge proportion of our population these days, the vast majority, is actually uh, distanced from the wild environment. They don't have that experience at all. And so, you know, we've got to somehow try and bridge that. Well, John, I think that is the perfect place to leave it. So thank you so much for talking to us. You're and all the welcome. very best with Skydance. I think it's a terrific book. And uh, we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. <laughs>